Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of MD Insight and I'm here today with Dr. Stephen Wexner, one of my colleagues in Florida and Dr. Wexner is the head of the Digestive Disease Centre in Florida. Steve, welcome and maybe you kick off by telling us a little bit about the group you run and what you've managed to build uh, over a long time now into such a phenomenal team. Well, thanks very much, Connor. I appreciate the invitation to be here. And, and actually, uh, we first opened for business to see patients 32 years and two days ago, February 29th of uh, 1988. So we just had our 32nd anniversary. I'm proud to say that I've been a member of the team here that entire time, having been recruited in October 1987 to come down and join David Jagelman in Florida. Uh, during that time, we started from having two colorectal surgeons, David and myself, one PA and one uh, nurse clinician, to a large active group of colorectal surgeons with one of the largest colorectal residency programs in, in North America, uh, with an active research presence in, in which we really touch upon pretty much every innovative area. In my role as the uh, Digestive Disease Center Director. I'm also responsible for the gastroenterology department uh, under the leadership of Tolga Aram, which is rapidly growing and expanding um, and encompasses all the different disciplines within GI of nutrition and advanced therapeutic endoscopy and inflammatory bowel disease and hereditary colorectal cancers uh, and motility. And um, also, we've got the pleasure and, and privilege of having uh, Jeff Ponsky coming down once a month from Maine campus. He's been uh, solely responsible for training our, our local team here in some of the advanced therapeutic endoscopic techniques. It's a tremendous group. Uh, just to single out one, Allison Schneider is, is now the president-elect of the Florida GI Society and uh, is a governor for the American College of Gastroenterology. Um, our general surgery department, which also falls under my direction from the perspective of the, of the Digestive Disease Center, uh, has been led by Raul Rosenthal since uh, I recruited Raul back uh, during my tenure as chief of staff, 1997 to 2008. Towards the beginning of that tenure, I recruited Raul probably around about 2000. Raul started and has um, spearheaded one of the world's leading bariatric surgical programs. Raul is the past president of the American Society of uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons. He's the president of the International Federation for Surgery of Obesity. He's the co-editor-in-chief of, of the journal Surgery for Obesity and Related Disorders. He's been chair of the fellowship uh, council and so on and so forth. And Raul's team uh, which includes multiple other outstanding surgeons, uh, really set the benchmark very high for the management of uh, bariatric surgery, as well as all of the other aspects of general surgery. So we're, we're a very uh, busy department uh, and a very busy center. We're, we're very happy that uh, within the U.S. News and World Report rankings, we are the, the, next, the next highest program, next highest ranked program going north is Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And the next highest ranked program going west is University of Texas Houston. So really for that entire swath of the southeast United States, those people I mentioned and all of the staff working with them have managed to get us to the very top of the pile uh, through hard work, ingenuity, uh, innovation, talent, affability, uh, and great results. Yeah, it's certainly quite a team. And one of the other things that's impressive is how much the, the site has grown and the hospital expansion over the last couple of years, fitting in with the growth of your, the practice of, of your crew primarily, because that's the largest group at the hospital. Um, and everybody else has, has truly been impressive. Now, I know that one of the things that's always been important to you is uh, the educational mission, and it's been an opportunity for collaboration with others, both nationally and internationally. So how do you see the future of education and international collaboration uh, going uh, in the, the modern era and the challenges of covering practices and things like that? I, I know you have plenty of considerations about the area. Well, 
I don't think we're ever going to completely get rid of in-person meetings. They do serve a purpose and that socialization and the informal discussion and getting to know each other and shake hands um, it, it can't be replaced by video conferencing and teleconferencing. However, there are practical considerations to travel uh, highlighted at the present time with, with uh, the, the virus uh, outbreak and meetings being canceled. So education's taken somewhat of a, a, it's morphed. So some meetings are lent to be by multimedia as we do with uh, innovations in surgery, surgical innovations, as we do with Surgery Live, with IBD Live, where it's a short meeting, people don't really have to disrupt their practices and they get to interact with folks around the world. Um, the Innovations in Surgery Conference, for example, we have something like 40 sites globally that participate. Surgery Live is growing. Um, and even at major meetings, occasionally there are some video hookups. The new dimension in the last, um, let's say, eight to 10 years is social media, where we, and I'm a, a fervent uh, user of social media uh, for only and strictly for business purposes, but disseminating results of studies, offering congratulations to alumni and to staff who've achieved something special, marketing meetings, telling the world, because not everyone can be at every meeting, what did the speaker say? What are the conclusions of the new study? Uh, and through dissemination on social media, ending up collaborating with people all over the world who I wouldn't necessarily meet. Um, I think social media tears down a lot of barriers, including time. Uh, time zones become less relevant. Language, as long as it's written in, in English or, you know, or, or Spanish seem to be the main two on social media, but certainly in English you can get a lot done. Um, and also seniority. I don't think as many young people, residents and, and faculty beginning their practices would approach um, senior mentors in person, I think it makes them much more comfortable to do so through Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. And by the time you've established a relationship in a remote sense, then they're very comfortable to come meet you at a meeting. And I, I must say, I've, I've mentored many people around the world and, and helped them with their projects and co-authored studies and performed investigation before I physically met them all, all remotely through social media and electronic means. That's a very new form of education, which has tremendous value. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think even if we look in Ohio here, over the last four or five years, we've grown from touching about nine or 10,000 people with educational events a year up to four times that. And uh, electronic media just allow us scale it in a, a unique way. Uh, social media is going to be interesting. I was actually just looking at something on medical schools recently, and they're talking about moving a lot of lectures away from classrooms. And then it just transforms how we educate groups. You maybe only need one or two groups of educators who can be the best educators. So it's a really interesting space and very exciting. So Steve, tell me a little bit. I, I know uh, a lot of the educational work you've done has morphed into standards and setting up new programs. And I know something that you're uh, very passionate and involved in is the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. Um, and so maybe you'd give, give folks an update on where that is and where you see that going over the coming years. Yeah, the, the um, National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer was a, a program started uh, with a core working group, including folks from Maine campus uh, and myself and, and Mariana Barrow in pathology and lab medicine here, uh, as well as American College of Radiology in 2011. And we spent um, several years developing the case, noting that rectal cancer outcomes in the United States lag behind rectal cancer outcomes in Europe. Also noting that within the United States, there are tremendous discrepancies in the care of patients. And specifically, we had very, very discouraging results in high rates of, of permanent colostomy construction, high rates of local recurrence, and high mortality from the cancer itself. Secondarily, all kinds of other things related to utilization cost and morbidity. So we had a call for action where we published a number of manuscripts in uh, high, impact high impact factor peer-reviewed journals and presented the data in different meetings. 
by 2014, uh, well, and, and backtrack to say that that working group very deliberately was not meant to be run by any one organization. So representation was there from the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, the Society for Surgical Oncology, the Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, and the Society of uh, American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. By virtue of the fact that I was past president of two of those four societies, SAGES and ASRS, I think it helped the conversation. It's a matter of just being at the right place at the right time. We then used Mariana's connections, uh, Dr. Barrow's connections at College of American Pathology to get us on their radar, and American College of Radiology was, was easy to follow suit once CAP was on board. So we had six organizations, and during this call to action period, we assembled what we needed to allow me to go forth and present on the accreditation committee, which I was a member at the time of the Commission on Cancer, as to why rectal cancer should be the first cancer with official um, uh, certif certification, site certification, not individual uh, surgeon certification, but uh, a site certification by the Commission on Cancer. Now, although there is a breast program, a program can be national accreditation program for breast centers, certified, accredited, but not COC accredited or vice versa. But we started with NAPRC saying the center must be COC accredited before the center could be NAPRC accredited. So that's a paradigm shift. The accreditation committee agreed, the executive committee agreed. I then went forth one month later in June 2014 to the Board of Regents of the ACS. As a regent, I, I was given the privilege of the floor to present it. The regents had to approve the funding to create the program. We spent three years designing the standards manual, beta testing sites, including Maine Campus and Florida as two of the six sites. Then ultimately the program rolled out in uh, late 2019, 2017 um, with uh, reviews really beginning in earnest in 2018 and 2019. Um, we now have about 15 NAPRC accredited programs. We've just trained additional surveyors because we have about 60 programs in various stages of requesting accreditation. So we, we imagine that within the first few years, we would have uh, something towards 100 programs accredited within the first several years. That might take three to five years to get there. Uh, but it's certainly off to a good start, and I'm gratified to see in the literature several manuscripts that have come out from people who were not involved in the design of the program and are not in leadership positions in the program, several who've published showing the benefits of the program, showing that by following what the program prescribes, outcomes are better. So we clearly are establishing our goal. As is said, uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery, and other groups of surgeons, HPB, esophagus, endocrine, have all been uh, inquiring about how such programs could possibly be duplicated in their respective specialties. So I, I think we took our time uh, from 2011 to now, that's nine years, it took us nine years to get here, which on the one hand is long, on the other hand it's short, um, but whichever way you look at it, we will be and already are improving outcomes for patients in the USA with rectal cancer. And I'm delighted that both Maine campus and, and Florida are, are pivotal uh, in, in, in that uh, important initiative. Yeah, well, congratulations to you. And I know many others were involved, so that's really good. And it's, uh, it's good to see both the standards and also the fact that it's multidisciplinary. So it really um, it provides standards for the whole team and for institutions to, to up their game as we manage a complex condition. So, Steve, maybe yeah, in the there's final... there's a lot of people involved. There's, uh, oh, there, yeah, there's absolutely. four societies. There, yeah. there's, there's basically 40 people in leadership, not counting representatives from the Resident Affiliate Society and the uh, um, Young uh, Surgeons uh, Association. Oh, super. Steve, maybe in the last minute or two, you'd give some perspective to people on the American College of Surgeons and the importance of its role in relating to hospitals and practitioners as we you know, fairly rapidly have to change the way many people practice going into the future. And with your experience as a regent of the college now for some time, um, I thought you might close with some perspective on the college and how it partners with us moving forward. 
Yeah, I, I think the American College of Surgeons is the house of surgery. It is the largest surgical body in the world. We have over 85,000 uh, members and fellows in virtually every discipline. Colorectal is one of the more active disciplines after general surgery, but we represent pediatric surgery, trauma surgery, HPB, orthopedics, neurosurgery, GYN, ENT, and so on, ophthalmology, the entire list of, of surgeons. And the ACS has become the trusted name in Washington, D.C. for policy. And when people on the Hill have questions about healthcare policy, they turn to the college to have those questions answered. Um, and the ACS, therefore, represents the entire house of surgery, not just in advocacy, also in education with, uh, as you know from your involvement in the education division with, with Dr. Satchadeva, tremendous innovative educational programs in the college that go on. The program we just discussed of the NAPRC is part of the quality programs. Uh, and we're very fortunate that a lot of our colleagues, uh, Heidi Nelson runs the uh, division, uh, the cancer programs, uh, all of the cancer programs, which is National Cancer Database, the AJCC, the NAPBC, the COC, the Alliance, uh, and all of these uh, National Cancer Database, all of these programs roll up turn. She in turn reports to Cliff Coe, who's also a colorectal surgeon. And the other quality programs the college has are the bariatric uh, uh, program and the pediatric program, and the geriatric program, and, and on and on. So the college is a tremendous resource for every single surgeon. And whether you're looking for the place for innovative education, the place by which quality can be assessed, NISQIP, for example, uh, the place where you can go to an annual meeting and, and find great things or read a journal like Jack's or Selected Readings, um, or whichever facet interests you, the college represents you. Um, and it's very important that all surgeons understand and support the American College of Surgeons because the ACS has a voice that no other surgical association has, and, and we need to support it. Absolutely. And I think what's also clear and what's also so important is that how much of it is centralized and driven around the concept of quality going back to the days of Codman. It's really been the foundation of the society. So, well, Steve, I'd like to thank you very much for taking time to chat today. Uh, I'm sure people will be really interested in hearing your thoughts. And I look forward to next time. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you very much, Connor.